Genesis chapter 21. I want to encourage you, uh, as usual, to be here Sunday morning for our Sunday School Disciple Fellowship, Ephesians chapter 4, talking about uh, our walk in the Lord and the lifestyle that comes as we take off the old clothes and put on the new. Oh, the best thing in my life. You know the song? We'll teach it to you sometime. Take off the old robe and put on the new. And so we'll be looking at that in Ephesians 4, and I was talking to Hal Ellerby today, and he was just saying how much God is opening his eyes, this time through Ephesians, and just blessing him, and I'd have to say the same. I'm so grateful for God's Word and the truths that Christ has given us in the New Testament. And so I want to encourage you to be here um, Sunday morning, 945, and, and then um, at 11, of course, we'll be in Matthew, at the end of Matthew chapter 19, and I was going to call the message, if I were a rich man, da 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 okay, anyways, um, but I decided the title didn't exactly fit, and I didn't want to ask Richard or how to come choreograph that uh, rich man dance that the Fiddler on the Roof does. So I'm sorry, we won't do that Sunday, but we will be in Matthew 19 talking about what can I do to have eternal life. Um, but before we get into Genesis 21 tonight, I want to remind you about kind of what's going on in the life, or what was going on in the life of Abraham. And you can probably relate to this, Abraham was having a lot of ups and a lot of downs in his life. Because uh, you go to Genesis chapter 18. And you find him, he's got a feast spread for God himself. God visited him with two other men or angels. And Abraham, he, he just put it on. And uh, with butter and everything, butter and cream. And it was good. And it was a feast. It opened, opened in his life to God. And God was reinforcing promises, encouraging him, and encouraging him in his life situation. Uh, his wife was barren. And yet God was telling uh, Abraham that Sarah would have a son, and he told it to Abraham within earshot of her to encourage her in the promises that God had made. And then you find Abraham communing with God and, and having influence in prayer with the God of heaven uh, in relation to the lives of men. So a mountaintop experience. But then in Genesis chapter 20, Abraham's in the valley because he is doing things that he did before he believed God. Uh, he's trying to pass off his sister as his wife to save his own scrawny neck. And shame on him. Um, but shame on us men when we don't be what God wants us to be and live by faith. And it has negative impact on our wives, on the people that are special in our lives. So ups and downs. Ups and downs. But what you'll notice as we get into Genesis 21. While Abraham's like this. And he's like this. And this. And this, God is like this, all the way through. So Genesis chapter 21, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, and bare Abraham a son in his old age. You say, how old was he? hundred. Yep, that's old. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, that Sarah should have nursed sons? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the day that Isaac was weaned. Our title tonight is this, Something Worth Celebrating. Something worth celebrating. 25 years of wandering and waiting for God. The waiting and wandering of Abraham and Sarah. And then they held in their hands living proof that they could trust God. And you might feel like you are doing a lot of wandering and waiting. 
wandering and waiting. And I want to encourage you, you can trust God too. You can. And that is something worth celebrating. It is. What if I told you that I wrote a check out to you, with your name on it, for a million dollars? Probably get a few different responses. Some people would be like, okay, enough jokes, Pastor. Um, when did you get into the lotto? Something like that. On the other hand, someone might just simply celebrate. What? A million bucks? Wow, you're just awesome. And you, you, know, you say, well, why those responses? Well, on one side, the pure skepticism would be because of my inability. And you would be right. My inability, people would be skeptical of, well, how could you do that? On the other side might be pure faith. I just trust him. I've gotten to know him, and he said it, so hey. And so just pure faith. I'm going to trust him and celebrate. But the truth is that check would bounce. It would. You know, you drop it on the floor and bang, and it bounce up to the ceiling. You don't trust people who write checks that can't be cashed. And I'm talking about real life, okay? Um, people that make promises that they can't keep. The, uh, there was a financial advisor who was trying to talk me um, into making a certain decision about our future and told me this, government retirement funding will always be there. It will always be there. And I'm not sure if that is a check I'll always be able to cash, especially if I look 70 years down the road, Lord willing, it, God gives me 90 plus years. I don't know if that is a check that will always be cash. Or perhaps you think of big government. Uh, the bigger government grows, that they often they make promises that they often can't, and as we find out along the way, often don't intend to keep. They're writing checks they can't cash. Um, or you think of damage done to children by fathers, uh, specifically after Father's Day, thinking about this on my mind, fathers who make promises that they don't keep or they can't keep. I promise you, I promise you. And then the damage that's caused when that check is not cashed. We've all had experiences where someone wrote us million-dollar checks that bounced. Now, I'm talking about something in your life that it was worth a million dollars for you, for them to say what they said, whether that was within a marriage or a spouse wrote you a check that bounced, or maybe it was prior to a marriage. You met an individual, and they, or you hear stories about young people, and, and he's slick, and he's got you know the Vaseline slicked hair, and sweeps her off her feet, and come to find out he's altogether different than he portrayed himself. Or maybe it's within a family, or maybe it's within a church family. Maybe you've been in a church environment, and... People have said, have seemed welcoming, and I pray that this never is a case here that will put on a welcoming face, but when they really get to know us, watch out. I pray that's never the case, and I, I know it is not. I'm thankful for God's grace. But it happens where people, uh, people can put on a front and write a check that they just can't cash. Or maybe it's within a company. You entered a company, and you had prospect of growth, and they said all these things could happen, but then you get on down the line, and hey, those things aren't happening. They wrote a check. They made a promise they did not intend to keep. Bounced checks, and I would say bounced big checks of life. Okay, I'm just stay with the analogy. They can be very discouraging. They can be very discouraging. And frankly, we all need to cash those million dollar checks. A, hurt, a healthy marriage is worth a million bucks. A healthy home and family is worth a million bucks. A healthy church is worth a million bucks. A healthy soul is worth a million bucks. There are some things we wish people would promise or could promise. Checks we wish they would write. Maybe you wish someone could, would promise you you'd get to see that loved one again. Or you'd get to have a healthy marriage and family. Someone promised you you'd have a fruitful church. And someone promised you you'd do well in life personally or professionally. Man writes checks that he can't always cash, but here's the deal. God never writes a check you can't cash. Now, if we were in a different kind of church, if we were in the charismatic movement, the word of, life, or word of faith movements and Benny Hinn and all that stuff, those guys write some checks that cannot be cashed. 
because they're writing them from a God who does not exist. But our God, the God of the Bible, he never writes a check you can't cash. He never makes a promise you can't trust. You can trust every promise that God has ever made. The validity of our faith rides on the fact that a whole bunch of promises were made about the Messiah that found their fulfillment exactly to a T in a person who loved people just like you and just like me. So let's talk about you a minute and how God never makes a promise you can't trust because you may yet be an unbeliever and maybe God is doing a work in your heart to make that more and more clear to you in your heart. And you may be an unbeliever and you may have life struggles and you may be without hope or without God. Or perhaps you're a believer with really deep hurts right now because of tragedy. Uh, maybe long-standing domestic or marital issues, maybe long-standing health or physical issues or emotional wounds or maybe recent all of the above. Maybe you're a believer with a lot of ups and downs like Abraham. One day or one week your life is up and open to Jesus and you're just in sync with him and you're happy. But the next day or next week you're down again and you're acting like you did before you came to know Jesus. Or maybe you're a believer wondering when God will fill in the blank. When is God going to give you victory over that sin? When is God going to actually come back to take us home? When is God going to grow you? Or when is gonna God, God going to grow? Or maybe you think about our church. When is He going to grow our church and, and uh, so we can see more people or make more disciples? Or when is God going to grow our church in just being disciples? The spiritual growth. Maybe there's some things that you're concerned about in somebody else's life and you're praying for them. And when is God going to work in them? How is He going to work in them to help them be more like Jesus? Listen, God has not written a check. You can't cash. He has not made you promises that you cannot trust. If you're an unbeliever here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ. He calls you to repent and believe the gospel and he has promised he'll forgive you and give you the Holy Ghost. He will wipe out all of your sin, all your guilt, all your shame from all the things that you've ever done and he will give you God's very presence in your soul forever. He'll give you that. He's promised that. If you come to Jesus, you will find rest in your soul. That is a check worth a million dollars, and it's yours. You can cash it if you will. Maybe you're a believer, and I, I want you to hold your place in Genesis 21. I just want you to be encouraged tonight. Hold your place in Genesis 21. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm just going to remind us, walk through some promises in the New Testament. These are checks that you can cash. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Jesus by the seaside, these fishermen. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You say, I'm having a hard time being a disciple. I'm having a hard time influencing others, making disciples. Well, God has written a check that if you will follow him, he will make you a fisher of men. If you will just follow him, he will change your life so you will be the disciple he wants you to be and you will make disciples. He's promised that. He's promised that. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 33. He said to his disciples, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God has promised you that if you will prioritize his kingdom and prioritize his way of life as a disciple, he will take care of all these things. What are all these things? Clothes on your back and food in your belly. All the basic needs you have, God has promised he'll take care of if you seek him first. He's promised that. Go over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. These are checks that God has already signed for you and you can take to the bank in your life. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. You're burdened, you're weary, you're carrying heavy loads. Verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hmm. Turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. He's promised to you, disciple, that if you'll follow him, 
He'll make you into a fisher of men. He'll use you in the lives of others. He's promised you if you'll seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, that he will meet every physical need you have. You don't got to worry about it. He's promised you if you're burdened and heavy laden with your own standards and your own expectations or the standards and expectations of some man, if you'll just come to him and learn of him, he will give rest to your soul. Well, look in John chapter 3, verse 16. We, listen, we believe if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have something very special. Verse 16, John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has promised you if you believed in his son everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You've done things in your life and I've done things in my life that make us worthy to be condemned before our holy God. But if you believed in Jesus you're not. No one can pick up a stone and throw it at you. No one, can, no, one, no one but God is worthy enough to accuse you of any wrong. But in Christ, you have, you have no wrong because of Him. You're forgiven. And you have, present tense, everlasting life as a believer in Jesus Christ. Go over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is a promise to a believer in Jesus Christ. Promises to people who have repented and believed the gospel. Promises from Jesus Christ Himself. Verse uh, 27. Chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. So thankful. I'm, a, I'm like a dumb sheep. Bah. I need my shepherd. I need to hear his voice. And I can hear it. He said I can. And I know them, he says. My shepherd knows me. And they follow me. They follow me. And watch what, he's, watch what he gives his sheep. I give unto them eternal life. There it is again. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. God has promised to us his sheep that we're in his hands forever. I, someone texted me the other day and said, oh, we pray that you'll be in God's hands. And, and I'm just rejoicing. in the fact. I just read this scripture that morning. I'm rejoicing in the fact that there there's nothing I can ever do to get out of those hands. I'm always in those hands. That's a promise you can take to the bank. You're always in his hands. Do you believe that? Have you cashed it? Um, we could go, uh, you go on over to Philippians chapter 1. I'll meet you there. Philippians chapter 1. Romans 8, you know this promise well. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, go past the Gospels, Acts, Romans, and go eat popcorn. You know, GEPC, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or General Electric Power Company, I don't know. God bless every Sunday school teacher helped us out, amen. Okay. But Philippians 1, but Romans 8, we know this, it says, we know, we know. Here's a promise, a check we can cash. We know all things, all things, all of them work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And what is that good? That good that will be resurrected with Christ at that last day. And when that happens, it's going to be forever. And all the problems, all the ills which are but for a moment, this light of affliction doesn't even, isn't even worthy to be compared with that future glory. And everything in your life is working to that day. That's a check you can cash. You're in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said, being confident of this very thing. He was confident about this in the lives of the Philippian believers. And they need to be confident about this. You need to be confident about this. Being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you. When you believe the gospel, God started working in you. In you. He said, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You say, I blew it again. Yeah. Okay, you did. But this isn't about you. This is about Him and His good work in you. And He will continue to perform that work in you until the day of Christ. One more text. 2 Peter chapter 1. Promises to believers. Checks you can cash. 2 Peter chapter 1. You catch up. I'm going to begin reading verse 2. Peter said to, the, to believers whose faith was under fire. 
grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Knowing God and knowing Jesus our Lord, it just multiplies grace and peace in your life. And l- listen to this, verse 3. According as His divine, His God His godly power, His power of deity, His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything we need for life, everything we need to live a spiritual or godly life, we've been given all of those things through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of Jesus, we have everything we need for life and to live a godly life, or live a life that's about God. And He says in verse 4, whereby, by Jesus... We're given exceeding great and precious promises. Million dollar checks. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, in life you can become more like Jesus. And God can shine through you and your good works. That can happen through the great and precious promises we have in Christ. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. These are checks you can cash, believer. Your life can be fruitful now, and it can be fruitful forever. And it will be because you have life everlasting. You have promises. So stay there in, in Second Peter. We, we may land the plane there if we don't do a helicopter landing before then. Okay? But stay there. But the point is there are checks you can cash. You can trust God is at work in your life. You can trust Him. You say, what about our church? Are there checks the church can cash? How about this? Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I will build my church. Christ is never done doing that. Calling people to himself who repent and believe and then live the life he calls them to live. He's always building his church. It may not be the way we think he should build it, but his way is a lot better than ours. It's a lot better Two chapters later, Matthew 18, verse 20, he said, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. That's a check we can cash every time we come together. Jesus Christ himself is with us. Matthew 28, as we go from here and go with the gospel, you know the Great Commission. He said, Go and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that whatsoever have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the world. We might feel as a church like this going with the gospel is an impossible thing. And it is if it wasn't for the fact Jesus has promised He's with us. And every time you go to work up at Old Dominion, Brother King, and every time you go have breakfast with your state trooper buddies, Brother Hal, and every time you see your haircut and your new barber who's going to take care of you, maybe you'll meet a barber, Brother Grant, that doesn't know Jesus. And every time, then the rest, I'm not going to, I might forget where some of you work and be embarrassed. But every time you go to a certain life context where there are people that don't know Jesus and you go to make disciples, you say, I can't, but he can. And he's promised to be with you as you do it. That's a check we as a church can cash as we go about his mission. And then I love this in John chapter 15 where he talks about being fruitful and how if we abide in him and abide in his words and love one another, we come together in unity and we pray together like we did tonight. We pray together like we are trying to do every time we gather as a church. We're trying to do in the disciple fellowships and God delights to answer prayer and give us joy that is uncontainable. And see answered prayers. He's promised. He said, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, I will give it you. That's a check that he, that he has given us that we can cash. You as a disciple, we as a church can thrive. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter how long it seems to take to get on our feet again, we can thrive spiritually until Jesus comes back and we will thrive eternally in His kingdom. Look at You see this right here? Here is your, here is our million dollar check. And you can trust it. And we can trust it. And you can cash it. And we will. We will be fruitful disciples where the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, those things will be in us. And the fruit of the Spirit will be produced through us. Those are checks we will cash. And and we will make disciples and send church planners because that's what Jesus has called us to do until He comes back. It's going to be wonderful, the fruit God produces. Our mission can and will happen because God keeps His promises. Now I want you to go back to Genesis 21. And I want you to see why, why we can be so 
excited about the fact that God writes checks that we can cash. That phrase, God keeps His promises, that is a matter-of-fact thing even if it's unbelievable. The fact God keeps His promises is a matter-of-fact thing even if it's unbelievable. The birth of Isaac is recorded so matter-of-factly. Did you notice that? It's like boom, 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 boom. So matter-of-fact. And the only emotion came from Sarah, as you would imagine. Abraham didn't exhibit a whole lot of emotion, just action. When God did it, it's like, boom, here it is, and this is why, and here we go. It was so matter-of-fact, yet emotionally unbelievable. You think about Abraham and Sarah. The first time we met them, she was barren. And God made big promises to them. He told Abraham, you leave your kindred and your father's house and go to the land I'll show you and I'll make of you a great nation and there's going to be blessings for all the nation. And they set out on this journey of faith and failure. Faith in the promises of God as God began to kept, kept showing Abraham as he got to Canaan. This is the land. And he gave him these awesome illustrations or these awesome things to capture his imagination. Abraham, your seed, your offspring are going to be like the dust of the earth. Your offspring is going to be like the stars in the heavens. And he promised him, my covenant will be with you forever and there will be kings that come out of your loins. And your people, I will be their God forever, Abraham. And not only that, but Sarah, your wife is going to have a son. Of According to the set time of life, next year she's going to have a son. And even when Abraham argued with God, well, what about plan B? What about Ishmael, which was one of Abraham's failures? Because Sarah came up with a plan. I, we, can't go, we don't have the time to go back to Genesis 6, 16 and remind ourselves of it. But Hagar or Sarah felt insecure about how she could not help Abraham fulfill the promises of God. And so she said, why don't you just marry Hagar? And they created a royal mess. And God, when later on he told Abraham, he said, listen, Sarah, your wife, who you don't think is worth much to you, she's going to have a son. He said, what about Ishmael? I'll take care of Ishmael. I'll bless Ishmael. But she She's going to have a son in a year, and his name's going to be Isaac, Abraham. And he reminded them. And even though there was much failure in their life, and he tried to give Sarah away, even after God said she's the one who's going to bear a son, God kept telling them, this is going to happen. And unbelievably, the Lord paid Sarah a visit and enabled her a 90-year-old. I talked to Mrs. Cook, who used to come with Brian Crocker today. Just turned 99. 99. Lord paid a 90-year-old woman a visit and enabled her to conceive and carry and birth a son to Abraham, a 100-year-old, at the exact time he said it would happen. You know what Sarah's morning sickness was? A cashed check. You know what Sarah's labor pains were? A cash check. You know what Isaac's birth was? A cash check. You know what Isaac nursing? She's holding this baby boy. She never thought possible. That was a cash check. Isaac being weaned and now he's growing and oh, let's throw a party. That's a cash check. A 100 year old man and a 9 year old woman with an infant of their own physical relationship. A cash check. God doesn't write checks that man can't cash. And that is something worth celebrating. A new baby is something worth celebrating. We had a friend, had a baby this past week, Jocelyn Gale Gale, so Elizabeth's already trying to match her up with baby Andrew. And a new baby to old parents. The, these, these parents in Texas, they're our age, they're friends of ours, but a new baby to old parents with promises from God that had to do with a land and an offspring that could not be counted, and, and, and he promised blessing to the broken, rebellious nations of the world through that baby. God doesn't doesn't write checks, man can't cash. Isaac's birth was something worth celebrating, and what's deeper is this, God's matter-of-fact faithfulness. All those promises we talked about that are yours, that are yea and amen in Christ Jesus, Paul would say, they are something worth celebrating. And every time we, every time we see those promises come true in our lives, every time we see an unbeliever repent and believe the gospel, every time we see a disciple growing in grace, every time we see a daily need that is met, and every time there's a baptism, and every time there's a disciple made, and every time there's an answer to prayer, every time you go to scripture and the Holy Ghost comforts you because God promised you would receive the Holy Ghost when you got saved. Every promise kept 
is something worth celebrating. God's matter of fact faithfulness is something worth celebrating. The fact that that silly alarm keeps going off is something worth celebrating because He's still with us. I'm sorry to embarrass you, brother. I just started capitalizing the moment. He's still with us. I thank, I thank God that alarm keeps going off. Because that means Grant Boyd, who we prayed here, is still with us. Every time a promise of God is kept, it is something worth celebrating. So what do you do with that? I'm going to land. I'm going to helicopter. Here we go. I want to honor your, respect your time. We're not going to go back to Second Peter. How did Abraham and Sarah respond? Abraham, he did, he did this, basically. He obeyed God to a T. Because when God keeps his promises to a T, you know what you ought to do? You ought to obey God to a T. God told him, you're going to have a son. His name's going to be Isaac. Guess what Abraham named his son? You kept your word, I better keep it too. Called him Isaac. God said, keep the covenant of circumcision after Abraham messed up with Hagar and Ishmael. Eight days after that boy was born, born, Abraham circumcised him to a T, as God said. He obeyed God to a T. He obeyed him, and God has kept his promises to you, and you ought to just obey him. And you, you know what Sarah did? So there's obey God. You know what Sarah did? She's laughing. Now, when God told her before, you're going to have a son, you're going to have a baby, <laughs> she's laughing. Abraham laughed. But who's laughing now? Now she's laughing because she's amazed. Wow. So you know what you ought to do since God keeps his promises? You ought to trust him. You ought to celebrate that he has given you a check you can cash, you can take. If you know him, if you've believed his promises, if you've made them yours, if you haven't made them yours, this is a different conversation. But if you have received Jesus, you have checks. This book is loaded with checks that, you are, that are yours, belong to you. God himself has signed and you can cash them. And so you ought to just be happy about it and celebrate it and obey him to a T and do it with a smile. Wondering at a God who can help you, an old person, still be fruitful in Jesus Christ.